Jesus, we lift up your name. 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 We lift up your name. If you want wisdom for daily living, to win your wars, you've come to the right place, the Word of God, the teaching of the Word of God. Remember God spoke to Joshua. He said, Joshua, if you want to win and have great success and be prosperous, he said, stay with the Word. Let not this Word depart out of your mouth. Don't, make me, don't let the Word get out of you. This is what we're doing, bringing the Word to you, bring success to you, and make sure you stay connected and let the friends know that the Word of God is being preached. Let's join in the Word. Joshua! Yeah. 
Greetings to you, TBN family, to the rest of the people that are follow our telecast. It's an honor to come through and to announce that we will be online for the rest of the year and having a, a telecast uh, on this TBN platform um, on every Sunday at 12.30. This is our slot, former slot. We can let your friends know, text your friends, the rest of Africa, all over the world to watch and to come into contact with that which God has placed upon our hearts. As you welcome us, we welcome you on our platform as well. Of course, if you want to interact with us, our details will be on the screen. I'd like to know you better. Let me say from the outset, I tend to be a very warm preacher. I love people. I am I'm cast from the stock of pastoral ministry that deals with people every day, greeting people, loving on people, um, making people's lives better, being used by God to better and improve the lives of people. It's my joy and it's my honor to participate in them and to be given the privilege by God to function in ministry from that perspective. Today I want to talk about a subject that is both, which is both, which is both opportune for our beginning our journey together on this platform, on TBN, and also for the future and for the relevance on this time that we're dealing with, the time of COVID. I want to talk about the roles of eyes, and specifically my title is, What Do You See? Maybe just before we get into it and going deeper into details about the eyes, it's important for us to look at the purpose of the eyes. What are the eyes for? If we look at various scripture, scriptures in the Bible, in the book of Matthew chapter 6, verse 22, it says, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your body, your whole body will be full of light. So number one, the eye tells us it's the, it's the gate in, into the soul of the person. So if the eyes are healthy, the body is healthy which means we're able to read into someone's life by looking at their eyes. The eyes can tell us a lot about your health, spiritual health, whether you're emotionally healthy or you're not emotionally healthy. David says in the book of Psalms 110, 101, I beg your pardon, verse number three says, I will not set before my eyes anything that is worthless. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. David says, He's here, he's talking about the power of example. He says, I will not make as an example, which means set before your eyes. You remember that um, as we were growing up and some families still do it and young people still do it. When they have an icon, when they have a, a hero that they, they respect, they honor, they love, they put it on their walls so that it's ever in front of their eyes to learn from, to draw inspiration from, to be inspired by that particular hero or heroine. And so David says, I want to choose my models. Who is my model in life? He says, I will not set before my eyes anything that is worthless. Therefore, he says, I hate the work of those who fall away. They will fall away, which means they start well. And in no time, they're gone. They're off the picture. And they can't be seen anymore. We heard that they started maybe a church or a ministry. They started well in business. But they've fallen away. Falling away, which means everything has gone. It's gone into um, has gone into nothing. Their energies and their hard work has gone into nothing. So David tells us clearly that be careful who you set before your eyes. He says, don't set anything that is worthless before your eyes. Set something that is very important that you can learn from. Choose your models properly. Your models in ministry. It's important who you follow. One decent um, man of God that I listened to who long passed away. He said, be careful who you follow because you'll end up being exactly like them in terms of how they preach, in terms of how they behave. One man, a man of God said, remember, be careful of the books you read because you'll end up becoming the, the same as the books you read, the people you spend your time with. As someone said, association breeds assimilation. In the book of 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, it says, But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance, on, on the height of his stature. Uh, talking, uh, talking about one of um, Jesse's sons, when Samuel had gone to Jesse and uh, to anoint a king, and God specifically wanted David to be anointed. And about Saul's eyes, God wanted David to be anointed, but Saul's eyes fall on someone else. Okay, fell on, fell on someone else. But the Lord said, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I've rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So we see he's a God who looks at the heart. Now that word heart and needs a little bit of explanation. We need to work with that term heart. That word heart in the Old Testament and in the New Testament Simply put, it talks about the immaterial, immaterial part of humanity. 
it talks about the inward parts of the human. It talks about, in, in, in when you carry the same term, in the, in the New Testament is the word, um, the word spirit. And remember, we know, based on the scriptural record, the Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonica 5, verse number 23, it tells us exactly that we are spirit beings. We, live in, we have souls and we live in the body. We are spirit beings. We are made in the image of God. God is a spirit. John 4, 24 tells us that. And if we are made in his image, and therefore we are spirit beings. God contacts us through by contacting my spirit. If God wants to communicate with me, he drops direction in directly into my spirit. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs 20, verse 27, the spirit of man is the candle light of the Lord. So what do you use the candle for? It's to light. It's good for light, to provide illumination for something. So if God wants to provide illumination for your life, for your future, for your family, for your business, the things that God would have you to do in life, in terms of God giving you direction, that is life-defining, that is it destiny enriching, he's going to communicate to your spirit. So if you keep your spirit clean, if you keep your spirit connected to God, there will always be a download from God to your spirit of things that we need to do. And we're just, we're just taking our time and evaluating the significance of the eyes and before we get deeper into the things, other things that we need to talk about. In the book of 2 Kings, chapter 6, verse number 17, it talks about, Then Elijah prayed and said, O Lord, talking about Elijah's servant, of course, and um, I beg your pardon, Elisha's servant. Elisha prayed. And then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. Well, I thought he has eyes, okay, at the time that he, he was a servant of Elisha. Yes, he had natural eyes, but he had not got to know God better for God to open his spiritual eyes, okay? And he says, open his eyes. He was talking about his spiritual eyes. And some of the people's eyes, spiritual eyes, need to, be, need, to be, need to be opened because if God does not open your spiritual eyes, you live on a, a lower level of life, always complaining about things that if you were to open your spiritual eyes about, you will see that God has already made provisions for and God has already taken care of those things. And, and sometimes it's painful to deal with people who are so... Uh, who are so fleshly, so carnal, and they don't see in the spirit what God is trying to do, trying to achieve. And yet, in the, in the carnal world, in the natural world, the Bible does warn us to be careful around how that world informs our faith. And that is why the Bible says, we walk not by sight, but by faith. Because most of the time, it may look like a mess, but in the spirit, God is fixing things up. It's just the devil, because it's a God of this world, the natural world that we see. And that is why he's trying to throw all kinds of things, but in the spirit, God is fixing things up. It says in the book of 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 17, and what is being fixed here, Pastor? What is happening here? Remember that there were soldiers around surrounding Elisha because Elisha was, 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 was passing on, communicating revelation to the king of, of Israel at the time and telling him all the plans they had, um, the, the plans that the king of, of, of Syria had. And the, the Bible said, then Elisha prayed and said, oh Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man. The Lord honored the prayer of Elisha and opened the eyes of the young man. And he saw her. And he saw, I pray that I may see too in the spirit. See things that nobody sees. <laughs> and see the, everything that God has for me. God that things have already provided. May I please have the eye. Maybe you, you, at the end of the sermon, it will be a prayer too. For me to see the provision of the Lord that in times of difficulty, it would be difficult to see it if I don't raise the bar, raise the level of not just operating with natural sight, but operating with spiritual sight. He then says, And the Lord opened the, uh, the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. There were more with Elisha, protecting Elijah, more than the Syrian soldiers and their natural chariots who were attacking Elijah. I don't know who am I talking to. God is, has me to tell you that there's more on your side than the ones that are fighting you. Oh, God is, will, oh, is on your side and will always be on your side. So those are just some of the functions of the eyes and sight that we have in the Bible. In the book of Psalms 119 verse 18, that, uh, David prays a very important prayer, which is my prayer all the time. It says, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. Okay. Open my eyes that I can behold wondrous things out of your law, out of your law. And most of us who are biblical scholars do understand that David, when he says law, we can re replace that with the word, with the word says the word of God, scriptures. He says, then open my eyes that I may see wondrous things in the scriptures. 
And once God opened your eyes, you see beautiful things in the scripture. I've been there when people ask me, how did you see that in scripture? I tell them I prayed a prayer. <laughs> what prayer did you pray, Pastor? I prayed the prayer for God to open my eyes to see the things in scripture that I teach, the things that I speak about. I see beautiful things in scripture. Many people say the Bible is too hard. The Bible is too big. Oh, I love it. It's a, it's, a, it's a solution to my problems. I love it. I see beautiful things. David says wondrous things, things full of wonder. I see things I never saw before. And sometimes I don't know about you. When God begins to show me these things in scripture, I jump up and down alone and I become joyous and I become happy and I'm full of joy and speakable, full of glory because I saw things I never saw before. And sometimes the things that the Holy Spirit would have me see in scripture because he has opened my spiritual eyes, spiritual eyes. He has me to see things that connect everything that I've been through together. I see, I see it. And I begin to say, I see it. I see what God is trying to do in my life. I see what God is trying to do in a ministry. Oh, oh my God, I see it. Because God has opened your eyes. Now that we've laid the foundation of what eyes are for, and we're asking the question, what do you see? But let's proceed to the New Testament and look at some things that are critical. We find out that the power of God upon Christ, look at this, very critical. Eyes are very important. Talking about eyes, sight, vision. The power of God upon Christ brought the blessing of sight upon those all who either were born blind or became blind for a reason or the other. So simply put, the anointing of God upon Christ, when Jesus was walking about, the Bible says, Matthew 9, 35, and Jesus walked about the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogue, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. As Jesus was doing that, part of what he does, as he explains in ministry in Luke chapter 4, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to, you know, uh, to heal the brokenhearted, you know, recover of sight to the blind. He had administered to the blind. The power of Christ the power of God upon Christ restored the sight of those who were either born blind or became blind for one reason or the other. And one of the things that we see just on that very fact, on the people that could not see, that were blind, that whose eyesight was, 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 um, was impaired or they could not see at all. Biblically, when we consult the Bible, certain things become clear to us. The first thing is that Biblically, every time when Christ healed a blind man or removed blindness or restored sight, great teaching moments were birthed out of God's action, redeeming humanity out of blindness. At that time when Christ healed those that could not see, we recognize this one point. Great teaching moments were birthed out of God's action, redeeming humanity out of blindness. So when Jesus, so we, we don't find Christ, let me put it like this, to, you know, to simplify the matter. We don't find Christ in scripture healing the blind and keeping quiet. All the time, the things he says and the things he does and the teachings he gives, give us great insight and teaching. And that's a, that's a thought for us to think about. Why would God place ex good, juicy teaching around healing the blind? Because God is a God of sight. Now, let's look for an example, if you didn't mind. Let's look for an example at the blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, and the blind beggar, okay? And that is found in the book of Mark chapter 10. Okay, in the book of Mark chapter 10. Let me read it from the CEV translation. In the book of Mark chapter 10. It says, Jesus and his disciples went to Jericho. I like that. Now what are we searching for, by the way? Don't forget my point I've just made. Is that around the action of Jesus healing the blind, extracting people from blindness and bringing them over to a place of full restored sight, there were great teaching moments that God undertook. And that's what we want to look at that. Jesus and his disciples went to Jericho, and as they were leaving, they were followed by a large crowd, the Bible says. A large crowd, and a blind beggar by the name of Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, because the word B-A-R, Ba, which means the son of. The son of Timaeus was sitting beside the road. I'm reading from the contemporary English translation. When he heard that it was Jesus from Nazareth, he shouted. I like that. He did not just go to a church where they were quiet. I'm sorry to say that. He shouted, Jesus, son of David. Have pity on me. Many people told him to stop, the Bible says. Many people told him to stop. Many people told him to stop. In other words, they're kind of like saying, it's not allowed to do what you're doing. And that is why I'm talking about great teachings. The Bible tells us that when this man wanted to reach to higher heights, wanted to lay a hold of what belonged to him, he wanted to be like everybody else who, who could see. He wanted to break through, wanted to get out of a situation of having nothing and step into greater things of God. He wanted to have his sight restored. He wanted 
based on his personal experience or having sat on the side of the road. He had calculated life and found out that sitting on the side of the road won't get me far. I need my sight to get far in life. He had a desire and ambition. He cherished a dream, a destiny for him to get far in life. And he knew that the only person that could restore his sight was Christ Jesus. The moment had arrived. He sensed the opportune moment. That is my time, it's my season to lay a hold for Jesus to pray for me and for, for me to have my sight restored. But at that moment, people told him to stop. How, how sad it is that when we in life want to become who God wants us to become, people have a, a negative impact. They pour water, cold water on your dreams. They told, tell you to stop. Why, you st why tell me to stop if you have it and I don't have it? Most of the time, we need to come to this one truth and this one realization in life that when it comes to your personal dreams, don't listen to people. Because if you listen to people, they're not going to tell anything better. Like they told this man, stop. And listen to what he did. Did he, did, he, did, he, did he respect the people? Did he stop? Nay, he did not stop. What else happened? The Bible says many people told him to stop. But he shouted even louder, Son of David, have mercy on me, have peace on me. The Bible says he disappointed the people and, and, and honored his personal dream. He shouted even louder. I don't know who I'm talking to. There are times when you do not have to fall within the expectations of people because you want the dream so bad. You want the vision so bad. You want to get this miracle from God so bad. And you must know there will be voices around you from people who are not saying, that are saying, not you. You will not get it. It will never happen to you. Voices that are canceling the faith that you have. Voices that are trying to eradicate the sense of hope and the sense of belief that you have. Trying to tell you it will never happen. And the Bible says, you do like this man did. Shout louder. Scream louder. Pray harder. Go for it harder. Chase it down. And what did happen? Whose side did Jesus stand on? Did Jesus stand on the side of the people who were telling the man stop? Stop screaming? Or did Jesus heal the man? Let's find out what happened. Then Jesus, many people told the man to stop. But he shouted even louder, and son of David have mercy on me. The Bible says, verse 49, Jesus stopped and said, call him over. Oh my God, here's this moment. The Bible says Jesus was going about his business, but he stopped for this one man who was consistently calling out on Jesus. So I'm letting you know that Jesus is a willing Jesus. He, wants, he will stop for you when, once you call on him. Even though people say you can't achieve it, but I'm here to let you know that you can achieve it. You've got a willing supplier and a provider on the side of Jesus who can provide everything that you need. And the Bible says, and, they, and Jesus called, stopped and said, call him over. They called out to the blind man and said, don't be afraid. Come on, he's calling for you. The same people that said, stop, now that Jesus is saying, come over, they are the ones that says, don't be afraid, go. But two minutes ago, there were the same people that said, stop. You see, you can't depend on people. They are, they, the one minute they say the one thing, the next moment they say the other thing. Yesterday, they were the ones discouraging you. And today, it's your moment. They're the one appreciating you. And that is why the Bible says, cursed is a man whose trust is in, is, is in humanity. You must trust in God. And what did Jesus do for the man? The Bible says they called, they called out to the, to the blind man. The man threw off his coat as he jumped and ran to Jesus. Jesus asked, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man answered, Master, I want to see. I want to see. I want to see. And that's my prayer today. I want to see more from Scripture. I want to see my opportunities. I'm going to talk about it later. So we find out that around the poor people, God gives us some of the life-defining lessons. Right here, we understand, we learn something about people. That when we go for, our, go for our goals in life, people will discourage us. But you need to rise above the level of discouragement and don't hate on them. Don't hate them. Just know that they will never be the ones who encourage you to go for it. You need something big on the inside. You need to trust God, trust your instinct, trust your faith that I'm going to go for it and I'm going to go and get it. Remember, this man did it solo. When everybody else said, no, stop, he was the only one that said, no, it's not a stop. It's a go for me. And when everybody said it's a red light, he said, I'm the only one who says it's a green light. Who says a green light? It depends what you see in your life. And so it's very important for us to understand that. Another translation, another text that I want us to look at in the book of Mark is in Mark chapter 8. Where Jesus healed a blind man as well. And when Jesus healed a blind man, there are certain truths that I want us to see. Mark chapter 8. It's when reading from verse number 
22 to verse number 26. It says in the New American Standard Bible says, and then they came to Bethsaida and some people brought a man who was blind to Jesus and begged him to touch him. Taking the man who was blind by the hand, he brought him out of the village and after spitting in his eyes, he laid his hands on him and he asked him, do you see anything? Jesus asking the blind man, do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see people, I see them like trees walking around. Then again, he laid his hands on his eyes. He looked intently and was restored. And he began to see everything clearly. And he sent him to his home saying, do not even go into the city or do not go into the village. So it's amazing. It's an amazing text. So the two things I want to draw here before we come to our last story in the Bible, which I want us to talk about, talk about seeing, talk about sight and vision, is this man's story. So the Bible says they brought this blind man to Jesus and, and Jesus, instead of praying for this man in front of everybody else, he takes him by the hand and the Bible says he led him out of the city. And on the city, he prayed for him. He prayed for him. After praying for him, he says, don't go back to the city. Don't go back there. Now, why would Jesus say, don't go back there? Okay, in other words, don't go back to level one because I've placed you on level two. You can't solve level two problems with level one thinking. Jesus was saying to this man, I've raised the buy in your life. I've shown you how it's done. Don't go back there. As a matter of fact, Jesus is saying something very important. He's saying to him, don't go back to a place because they will mock the supernatural. The people that you're spending time with, they will, you don't have the faith to deal with the negative and the hostile words they have against the miracle you've just received. And Jesus is warning us about certain environments we should not go back to after we have received our breakthrough. Because some people who speak down on the breakthrough, they will either speak you down or speak the breakthrough down. And Jesus says, it says he needs to save us from the negative words by not going back. I don't know who am I talking to. There are some people, God has given you something good and he's telling you, don't go back where you are. I plucked you out. I took you out. I graced you. I saved you. I blessed you. I healed you. I provided for you. Don't go back there to that level, kind of lower level of thinking, lack of faith, lack of belief. Lack of prayer. Now that I've saved you, you need to act responsibly and keep what I have. And in terms of management and thinking and solution provision, he says to go back, don't go back to level one because the problems you're facing at work in your life, they need level two thinking. I've given you level two thinking, don't go back to level one because you are not going to find solution to solve level two thinking. You need a level higher than you to solve the problems where you are. And God has got that level for you to provide the answers that we need to see. And then lastly, as we're talking about sight and seeing, I want to look at Jesus. I want to look at how Jesus looked at things. And in the, for that, I want to go to Matthew chapter 9, verse number 35. In verse, from verse 35 right through verse number, 30, verse number 38. And that for me is the creme de la creme of how Jesus looked at things. Okay. So Jesus then, the Bible tells us in the book of Matthew chapter 9, verse number 35. Maybe let me read that. And sometimes we do much damage by quoting it and not reading it. Let's read that. Matthew 9, verse number 35, it says, Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw eyes, remember you see with the eyes, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion, because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, Harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Question Jesus. How can you see a plentiful harvest among people who are weak, weary, helpless, harassed? For, for all I care, those type of people are people that are spent. They have spent all their energy that they have in life. When you read different translation, it begins to define the people out of which Jesus saw value. So among the people that were spent, weary, and tired, Jesus saw value. He saw an opportunity. He says, I see a harvest here. Yeah? Harvest is plentiful. And, uh, and when Jesus saw an opportunity, he says, remember, you don't get harvest without sowing the seed. He says, if you work on the opportunity in life, the opportunity will produce great profitability, great harvest, and great fruitfulness, Jesus says. But where did it start? If I was Jesus, I would say, oh, these people are problematic. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I would not look at life as the Jesus looked at life. Now, the Bible says in Matthew 9, 36, different translation, the NIV says, these people were harassed and helpless. If they're helpless, they can't help you with anything. Even if you start any business with them, they won't help you with ideas. And they're helpless. They're quite helpless. They don't have the money. They don't have anything else. And they are harassed. 
harass people. They need a lot of attention and a lot of care. Harass people. They need a lot of psychological care, prayer, and a lot of counseling. And Jesus, out of the people that are problem people, he's seeing a harvest. How does Jesus look at things? How does he look at things? And, uh, and I, I would be looking at these people and thinking these people, are, oh my God, I can't do anything with these people. But Jesus had a way of looking at things. He saw gold in the dust. <laughs> he saw opportunity in the problem. And may God make us see what we need to see. And that's why my sermon to you is, what do you see? I pray that you see the way Jesus saw. Another translation says, the NLT says, they were confused and helpless. The Berean Lutheran Bible says, they were wearied and cast away. The King James has said, they fainted and scattered abroad. Scattered, which means it carries a sense of being broken. They were a broken mess. These people's lives were broken. They were in peace. Their lives were in pieces. Their vision is that way. Their life is going that direction. There's no order in their life. There's no direction in their life. But Jesus says, this is a harvest. He looked at the problem and he saw what he could make out of them. And, uh, and that's what God is trying to tell us today. And I pray for you. And during even this time of COVID, even in your life and in your business, may you see opportunity where there's problems. In all the problems, may let everybody talk about the problems that exist. Let them talk about the problem of COVID. Let them talk about the problem of economy. But may God give you a set of eyes, spiritual eyes, to see an opportunity, to see a business opportunity. And some of the businesses, and some of the greatest business in America, well, I'm not going to advertise businesses on, on, online and on, 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 on this TV slot. But different kinds of some of the big businesses, computer businesses, they were started in difficult times, in challenging times. Why? Because somebody believed, even though it's difficult, but I have an opportunity. I pray may God see you. You may see life as being scattered. You may, and the Bible, other, the other translations say, these people were distressed and downcast. And the economy might be distressed and downcast. It might be at the slowest point. And the Bible says some of the people were distressed and dejected. They were weary and worn out. Another translation, they were troubled and helpless. That, that's the God's word translation. Another one says they were faint and cast aside. Even though economy is faint and cast aside, but the opportunity is yours. You can reap the harvest. And Jesus says, I can reap the harvest. So for you to go the harvest, you must sow the seed. So you must pay attention to it. You must work on the opportunities that God is giving you. They are not just going to come out to you just like that. You must take time. I pray that God gives you a set of eyes that make you see what you need to see. May you see with the eyes of your spirit and see what nobody else has seen. And that's the problem. When you study management and leadership studies, they tell us that there are many companies who could not see an opportunity and they fell out. They fell out. When you talk about telephones, the mobile phones, there's a particular company that could not see when touchscreen came in. When companies like Apple companies, they say Motorola company could not see. They were leading. They're part of the leading companies. Just at the time when the, the cell phone companies with the touchscreen were starting, they mocked at, them, at, the, at that kind of technology. They looked down upon it. Little do they know that some of the companies that saw an opportunity would make trillions of dollars. Trillions. I'm not talking about rands. Trillions of dollars. And today they are celebrated worldwide. And some of the companies that did not see an opportunity, they mocked at the opportunity. And today they are nowhere else to be found. And some were sold for only $2 million. They were sold for a piece of cake. They used to be worth $23 million billion. Some companies like that. But they were sold for $2 million. Think about that. They had lost their value because somebody in management, somebody in leadership could not have their eyes to see an opportunity coming. I pray that, as usually happens in Africa, our leaders in Africa and us leaders in churches and every leader in business you might be a director CEO wherever you are may God give you the eyes may you never see a marketing opportunity of a product that can bring millions may God see show you an opportunity that yet is yet unborn yet unseen yet untapped market but God has shown it to you because when he wants to take your feather he's going to reveal to your spirit the opportunities that are going to come your way May God help you not only to follow the cross of Jesus, but to look at how Jesus looked at things. May God open the spiritual eyes. May you see. And the question I have as I close, what do you see? Pray to God to make you see better. See opportunities better. See money coming. See your products being sold. See you starting a company in, in places and locations people thought you would never start. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Your name, we 
We sing a hallelujah. As we, cl- as, as we close the service, maybe you've never met Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Thank you for listening. Maybe I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer with us. Not even maybe, I'm asking you to pray this prayer with us. Say, Lord Jesus, I invite you to come into my heart. I ask you to save me and wash me clean in your blood. I give my life to you. I believe in my heart. When God raised you from the dead, he was raising me from death as well. To be saved and to be born again. I receive you and thank you for saving me. Thank you for coming through to our telecast in the name of Jesus. I let the song to close in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening to the Word of God. Don't forget to share with friends and tell them it will always remain online on our Facebook and social media platforms. The Word of God. When it's preached, be doers of the Word. And don't forget, we do our part. We ask you to do your part. Our bank details will be on the screen asking you to support us because we're even going bigger and wider and we are on TBN now. Remember, our services on Thursday, in-person service. Now we have Wednesdays and Thursdays. We invite you to come, present yourself to hear the word of God speaking into your life. Thus saith the Lord. We love you. God bless you.